It can be someone who is extremely experienced in cybersecurity. It, it doesn't matter. We're all human. We're all susceptible, unfortunately, to being scammed. And once you see the negative narrative around people in cybersecurity, I'm afraid you can't unsee it. It's, it's yeah, bad. I noticed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So welcome back to the podcast. Today we have Dr. Jessica Barker with us to talk about the human side of cybersecurity. So um, Dr. Jessica Barker, MBE, is an award-winning leader in the human side of cybersecurity and has delivered face-to-face -face awareness sessions to over 50,000 people. She's the go-to expert for media like BBC and Wired, and she's delivered over 80 keynotes, including the NATO, the World Government Summit, and uh, essentially based on your LinkedIn, everyone that you could ever think of. It's very impressive. Um, <laughs> serves on numerous <laughs> boards, including the UK Government Cybersecurity Advisory Board, and she is the author of a best-selling book that I read this week called Confident Cybersecurity. Um, so we're so glad to have you on today, Jessica. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. That was a great introduction. Can I take you everywhere with me? <laughs> I mean, that, that was your, I mean, you, you set it up very nicely on your, your website. You made it easy. So, um, uh, yeah, so you yeah, delivered, uh, it. So you delivered it very the, nicely. The short version, just to catch everyone up was I joined TikTok about, I don't know, two months ago and didn't really know what to expect. Didn't even know who was on there. And uh, very quickly ran into Jessica's content, right? And I will say that I immediately clicked with your content as soon as I saw it because I was like, oh my gosh, this is the message that um, you don't hear in cybersecurity, right? Just your delivery, the things you had to say. And now I, I think of you literally almost on a daily basis in my job now because I um, see a lot of the myths and things you bring up. So it's been very inspiring. <laughs> That's so cool. It was very similar for me. I joined TikTok some point last year. Confession to actually look at the security settings for a video <laughs> on somewhere else. And then um, I was like, oh, well, I'm on TikTok. I might as well put a few videos up. Then I forgot about it for about four months. I went back in and one of my videos had had a lot of views. And I was like, oh, hmm, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe there's something <laughs> here. So then I kind of started using TikTok similar just a few months ago, found you. And I was like, this is amazing. I love your content. Let's be friends. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. Mine's a little less uh, clearly messaged. Mine's just kind of like learn a little bit and some memes, but you know, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it though. <laughs> I do. You're doing yourself short. I, I, that's, that's the self-deprecating humor. That's, that's just how I do. Um, <laughs> So yeah, and I, I will say too, again, along that same thread, right? So I found you on TikTok and, you know, you had great content, but then I looked up your profile and I was like, oh my God, right? So very first thing I saw, which I didn't mention this from your bio, was how you were awarded an MBE um, by King Charles. So for people who aren't familiar with that, um, if someone's appointed an MBE or member of the most excellent order of the British Empire, it's for... Um, an outstanding achievement, service to the community that has had a long-term significant impact. So for you, that's cybersecurity. I yeah. mean, I mean, to me, that was mind blowing. Um, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah, what, what, what was the experience like for you? Like, I, I would love to just hear what was happening on the inside. Yeah, it was, it was wild. It was amazing. I discovered that I'd been nominated and um, awarded an MBE last year in the summer i received a letter saying um that i had been awarded the mbe by king charles in his first set of honors uh, his birthday honors and um it was mind-blowing to get the letter and then they say you know you can't you can't tell anyone um until it goes public it then went um, public and then I was invited to Windsor Castle for the investiture basically the ceremony where they pin the medal on you and you don't know until the day who's going to do that you know it'll be a member of the royal family and for me it was Prince William and I was exceptionally nervous <laughs> way more nervous than I expected um, obviously I expected to be nervous but yeah meeting royalty and Windsor Castle Windsor Castle has been around since William the Conqueror there's amazing armor everywhere there's all these amazing artifacts and art and there's incredible music playing and then you're in this very fancy room 
there's Prince William and you have to do a certain number of steps here and then a certain number of steps there and then you have to curtsy. I'd practice my curtsy great when I practice. Did you really? Oh yeah. I yeah. and I'm so glad I did practice because it was very wobbly despite the practice. Really? So I dread to think if I hadn't practiced what would have happened. Um but then walk forward Prince William says congratulations um pins the medal on you and then he asked me lots of actually great questions about cyber security shook my hand and I sort of wobbled away <laughs> I feel like that was almost like when you said you got the letter and you had to keep it a secret I felt like that was your Hogwarts moment almost like right. this right. oh you, you, you're a wizard Harry um, also though there's always that element of this is a scam this is I do this yeah. every day this is a scam <laughs> right right from your mindset <laughs> Right. That's funny. So you received the letter, but um, again, I'm not super familiar with the process. Like, were you surprised to receive this or like, do you get nominated? Like, maybe you could shed so light on that. You're nominated, but the rules have been around a long time. You know, you're not supposed to know. You're not supposed to know who nominates you. Somebody does all the work in the background, filling in lots of forms. And then, then you get this letter and I should say that there's a little more to the story in that actually the letter arrived three days after myself and my husband went to the Royal Garden Party at Buckingham Palace oh. for King Charles's coronation. And that I really did think was a scam because I got an email. <laughs> it's not regular, by the way, for me to hang out yeah. with royalty. That's not a thing in my life. Um, but I got this email saying he's been invited to the the royal garden party to celebrate the king's coronation and i'm like i'm not clicking that link oh yes <laughs> um but um a benefit of having a hacker as a husband is that he you know handles all my potential phishing emails and he's like no it's legit click that link and so we went to this royal garden party three days later i get the letter saying you've been nominated for the mbe so we think the garden party was like vetting us oh. <laughs> like will they behave um at a royal occasion okay they will she can get the mb like whether or <laughs> not you were theory. civilized enough to be uh -huh. to be honored wow that's my theory <laughs> i have no basis other than timing yeah. that's hilarious i just have this image of like being secretly tested like <laughs> By your choice of tea or you know how you entered the room or i don't, I don't even right. can't even imagine but yeah did i handle the teacup properly i mean yes. who knows, right? thank you yes yeah exactly um well yes that was and i i honestly i teared up i mean i hadn't even met you yet but i was watching the video on youtube and i was like oh my gosh i'm so yeah. proud of her because i mean how oh, cool thank you um so much. But anyway, I want to I want to get into the really fun stuff that you that you talk about on all your channels. Um, so you're a leader in the human side of cybersecurity, and from exploring all of your work, um, I know there's not a short answer to this question. But for our viewers, could you summarize what the human side of cybersecurity actually is, like in a couple sentences? When people hear cybersecurity, it's really common for people to jump straight to the technical and to assume it is purely technical. And that was my perception as well. When I was approached for a job in this industry, I kind of thought, how do I have a place here? My background's in sociology, politics, and uh, civic design, engineering, um, PhD. And then suddenly I'm headhunted for cybersecurity. And I think, well, I'm not a hacker. I don't, you know. I'm, that, that's not me. And then I quickly learned that there is, of course, as much as this field is about technology, it's also about people. It is people who develop, design, um, use, abuse technology. It's people who destroy the technology. It's people who share information. It's all really about the intersection of people and technology. So we focus very much on the tech side, but we're increasingly as a field learning to understand that actually sociology, psychology, neuroscience, what makes people tick and what makes them act in a certain way, that is hugely important when it comes to cybersecurity, where a lot of what we're trying to do is positively influence leaders, people. Mm -hmm. We're trying to communicate technical messages in a more um, compelling and engaging way. So everything that really we're trying to do in cybersecurity has a human element to it. 
Uh, yeah, it's so funny too because it's. I feel like it's hard to sum it up for that reason, right? Like you said, that's just it. Just is cybersecurity is people. I mean, it's it, you, nobody would ask. Oh, what is the technical side of cybersecurity, right? <laughs> like, well, so duh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like machines, machines aren't attacking machines by themselves. You know, yes, AI right. is here, but there's still people in the mix. There is, you know, there's no such thing as a malicious. Uh, machine and the technology by itself is is fine <laughs> it's sure. um, you know it's all about people it's how we build that technology it's how we use it it's whether we make systems that are friendly for people to use and then of course there's the whole element of who is doing the attacking and the human element of what motivates cyber criminals and how do they operate and how do they manipulate us when it comes to social engineering, of course. It's all very interesting, too. I mean, I think arguably it's the most interesting part of cybersecurity if you want to, especially if you're into, um, I don't know, like crime documentaries. And I don't know, I feel like there's a large segment of us who are who are fascinated by the motives of of criminals like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think trying to understand things that don't on the surface necessarily make sense. It's fascinating what motivates people to to act in such a way. I find it really interesting to think about, you know, we have different types of hackers, legal, ethical hackers, then we have criminal hackers. And where's that point where somebody decides to go one way or the other? There's so many fascinating elements to the human side that for me, it's, um, it's you know, I caught the bug when I was offered that job like 13, 14 years ago, and I've never looked back. I was surprised by that too. So, um, you know, like I said, I was reading your book, your first best-selling book, and yeah, you were recruited by just randomly recruited by an agency. Was this after college, or you said it like this wasn't was, on your radar? Not at all. No, it was after my PhD. I was wrapping that up. That was in civic design, which is an engineering discipline, and I was really looking at the growth of the internet economy and the impact on places and spaces. And then I was headhunted by an organization that had heard about my research and had the foresight to realize that they had all the technical capability they needed. They wanted someone who could talk to people, understand people, um, lead interviews and bring a kind of qualitative element to the work that they were doing, looking at cybersecurity maturity, particularly in the defense sector. And so I was approached and I genuinely Googled what is cybersecurity <laughs> yeah. and was like, this is OK, <laughs> this is not me. Um, but it was just kind of raising its profile a little bit. There'd just been a new strategy at the government level in the UK. It was it was kind of a little bit current at the time. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. This is something different. And so eventually, yeah, took the took so the job. So it wasn't a hard well. sell. Like, you, like they contacted you and you're just kind of like, well, that sounds interesting. Or like, did they have to sell you on this? Like, no, we promise it's going to be fun. <laughs> it was probably a bit of both on both sides of like um, them helping me see what the role would be and understand that. Um, me being willing to kind of take that leap into the dark a little bit and. Um, know that I was going to have a really steep learning curve and then of course they were taking a chance on me and um, me helping them see that actually there was something I could bring to this that would be valuable and helpful. Absolutely and you know I will say to um, in terms of what you've contributed to the messaging around the human side of cybersecurity, um, I think that the main message I've taken away and maybe this is just me putting my own lens on things but um, it's really about advocating for people. Um, I'm trying I to, that. I wrote down a couple of quotes, but you know, I think you put on your YouTube, you know, you, you talk about the biggest cyber threats we face and how we can all better protect ourselves, but really you're adv advocating for, you know, more positive cultures, for empowering people, for, you know, being on people's side when they are the victims of a cyber attack. Um, and I think that that is uh, pretty novel. I think we do tend to blame people. Yeah. Uh, all the time. I, I, mm -hmm. I literally this week, I think I've seen three different social media posts or videos that have been like, oh, you know, 83% of, you know, mm -hmm. attacks are because of, you know, the person or, you know, it, it was originated with the person um, or oh, people are the weakest link. Yeah. Um, 
but but once, as you talk about though right that's that's not the case right that um yeah. it's not just these really weak stupid people who are being <laughs> manipulated <laughs> It's like when we look around at what people achieve, um, what what people do, it just seems wild to me that we then say people are the weakest link. It's like it can be someone who has started a, a business or who is really successful in their field or, you know, who's who's really professionally fantastic. It can be someone who is extremely experienced in cybersecurity. It it doesn't matter. We're all human. We're all susceptible, unfortunately, to being scammed. And once you see the negative narrative around people in cybersecurity, I'm afraid you can't unsee it. It's, it's yeah, there. I noticed. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you see it all the time and you realize like why are we talking about people in such a way especially when we need people to engage with us so for me it's it's a very unfair narrative and i find it really strange as well because it's what what in sociology we would call othering it's like us versus them oh, so we yeah. talk about people or users as if we aren't people and users ourselves um, and also very much ties into that victim blaming. So with a background in sociology, I was able to kind of look at this stuff with a kind of a criminology hat on and think about victim blaming, which people have a tendency to do because it makes us feel like we will never be a victim. So if mm. I can say, oh, they were so stupid to click on that link, I am subconsciously reassuring myself that I would never click on that link. Interesting. When it's it's, you know, it's just not the case. Yes, we can be educated, we can be more aware, we can understand scammers tactics, but we can all be tired, we can all feel overwhelmed, mm -hmm. overworked, be dealing with systems that aren't user friendly, all sorts of reasons why we may click on that link or download that attachment or transfer that money before we realize we've been scammed. Yeah, for sure. Well, and you know, cybersecurity attacks have also gotten more sophisticated. I feel like a lot of us have that image of the Nigerian prince and you know, well, who takes a random email from someone claiming to be a prince and you know, sends them money, right? But um yeah. I mean, that's a lot of what you talk about on your channel too are the various forms of basically scam arting that happen. Absolutely. And cyber criminals know this as well. They know we have become more savvy. So they know we've become more savvy to those foreign prince wants to give us money if we just transfer a sum or they know we've become more savvy in general to email phishing and that our filtering and our technical defenses have improved and so they evolve. So now we are, we still see of course those basic phishes but we also are seeing more sophisticated, more convincing phishing attempts. We've seen a big move over recent years to expand communication channels. So yes, phishing over email is still most common but this is why we've seen way more over WhatsApp and other messaging platforms, you know, over text message, over the phone, over social mm -hmm. media, because they know that we have become more savvy and have better defenses against email phishing. So they've got better. They're often, you know, trained scammers who share information and playbooks with each other. They know what works. They know how to manipulate us. And a lot of people don't realize that this is really being led by organized criminal gangs who operate in a very organized, sophisticated type of way. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, and, you know, kind of branching off of that too, right? Um, the stereotype of it being usually like older folks. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I recently managed an employee like right out of college, right? Smart guy. And um, I remember getting a phone call from him one day because he said, you know, Erica, um, someone emailed me saying that you urgently needed gift cards for a client. And, you know, at the time, right, that's something I could have maybe asked for. And sure. um, I can't remember what tipped him off. I think I, the person used a word in the email that mm -hmm. just didn't seem like me. Um, and, you know, ended up calling me. And I remember being, um, I don't, I, I guess, kind of stunned because it didn't even occur to me, right, to to provide that cybersecurity education to my yeah. employees. Um, you just don't ever think it would happen to you, you know? Absolutely. And you're right, there can be a lot of perceptions out there over who is more likely to be scammed. But that's a great example. You've got somebody, it sounds like fairly new in role. So people yes. who are new in role in an organization can be more vulnerable because they 
they want to 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 please they want to fit in they don't want to make mistakes absolutely so and they also maybe are intimidated so if you know if they didn't have someone who um, they were reporting to who was approachable and open to questions and taking phone calls then they may feel like i don't want to ask so i'll just do what they're asking for in the email but there you have someone who applied critical thinking it was some phrase or word in the email that ticked them off. It goes to show how their mindset was so good at spotting that. And then they picked up the phone and called you, which is a fantastic thing to do to verify it. And it shows a great relationship there that they know they can pick up the phone and check. That's the kind of thing we really need to foster more of when it comes to security. So I guess not even necessarily the ability to just foresee any and all possible forms of manipulation and scam arting, but the ability to work together and to trust one another and I guess prevent it as a team effort is, yeah. a, is a good way of saying it. That's maybe. it. It's, I think part of it comes down to the mindset. I always say to people, be especially alert to something that is unexpected, makes you feel something, asks you to do something. Now, all phishing, social engineering won't fit that. We are seeing more phishing where they build up a rapport before they ask you to do something. But a lot of social engineering does tick those three sort of red flags, unexpected, makes you feel an emotion. So it makes you respond in a more kind of knee jerk way. And then they're asking you to do something. That's what they want. So partly having that mindset can really help people and applying critical thinking. And then also absolutely having the right kind of culture where people can ask questions and not feel intimidated. And going back to that earlier point, if we tell people that they're stupid and that they're the weakest link and that they're the problem, then surprise, surprise, they don't want to engage with us so much and they don't want to ask a question sure, yeah. where, where they might feel stupid asking the question. Right. Or if he had had, uh, you know, sent gift card money, mm-hmm. right? Being afraid to tell me that. Yes. I mean, that's a huge issue. And it's one of the biggest indicators for me when I'm working with an organization of do they have a positive, more of a positive or more of a negative security culture. And if people are unwilling to report, if people are scared to report, whether it's a near miss or an incident, then that for me speaks volumes of the culture because what we need more than anything in cybersecurity is for people to tell us quickly if they think something has gone wrong. And this was was called out in the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report last year, like time is of the essence. If something has happened, Mm -hmm. then we need to know. And if we want people to tell us, then we have to make them feel comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. And you you know what, okay, and I had sort of questions I wanted to ask you in order, but you know, you have a great answer that I wanna keep, uh, keep talking about so so speaking of culture right culture is really hard to change culture is has a lot of variables involved a lot of people involved um what does that look like when when you go into somebody's company and and you want to make those positive changes is this a long-term strategy that you're implementing is this just a people strategy. Maybe you could speak a little bit to what that process is Absolutely. like. Absolutely. You're right. Culture takes time. And that's a really important message to help people understand because it's easy to become frustrated. If you are the one working on awareness, behavior, and culture in an organization, and often it is an individual, often it's can be just half of their role or one person or a very mm-hmm. small team, it can be frustrating so it's important to take stock of the wins along the way because culture usually takes years to change and depending on how embedded that culture is that you're trying to change depending on the obstacles you're facing it can take a really long time the first thing is understanding the kind of culture that you have around cybersecurity. People will often say we want to build a security culture. From my point of view, you have one, whether you know it or not, whether it's positive <laughs> yeah. or negative, you've already got a cybersecurity culture. It just depends whether it's the kind of culture that you would try to build and whether it's one that's going in your favor or working against you. So the first thing is really understanding it and understanding, particularly if people aren't practicing the behaviors that you want, then understanding why. It can be really easy to get frustrated and think everybody has terrible passwords, our click rate's really high, nobody's reporting, and to just think it's because people are 
not doing what you want. They're just being difficult. Mm -hmm. When usually people will have a reason that is logical to them. And most people are not wanting to be malicious when it comes to cybersecurity. We have that small percentage, that's a different matter. But most people want to do at least an okay job, if not a good job. And they don't really want to cause yeah. an incident. So there's usually some kind of blocker. Identifying those blockers is really important. And it could be down to conflicting values. I see this a lot with the organizations mm -hmm. we work with, where we, we hold focus groups. That's how we, we really try to, to, to dig into these questions. And a lot mm -hmm. of the time I will discover people, on the one hand, they know the security policy, they know what they're supposed to do. On the other hand, the organization might be really pushing a culture and priorities around productivity. So if you, for example, mm -hmm. if you work in a call center, I used to work in a call center myself. If you work in a call center, you might be told you need to do X, Y, Z to verify a customer's identity. But if you're also told that your targets, your performance indicators, maybe even your wage is tied to how quickly you get through calls, which are you going to pay attention to? You're going to pay attention to the drive for productivity and for being quick. So sure. things like that, those kind of conflicts can be really crucial in what a cybersecurity culture is actually like. Productivity goals were the first thing I thought of as soon as you said that too. Okay. The the mm -hmm. uh, urgent workplace culture, you know, if, if you have a hard time even getting your work done, why would you make time to implement proper security practices or to actually read or listen to the security training? Yeah. And we see this a lot with development communities that we work with. If you're a developer and, you know, you, there's an emphasis on you getting the code out, then you don't have time to, to think about security. And you might know um, what you're supposed to do, but that doesn't mean that you have the time to build or review in a way that you would like to from a security perspective because you're under pressure, right? Mm-hmm. Are there other really common blockers like that that you see, like maybe one or two others? I'm just curious because productivity was the only thing that immediately came to mind. Yeah, absolutely. We see things as well around, it can be really simple, but yeah. for example, around passwords. So um, sometimes organizations will be telling people, oh, you need to you know, not use weak passwords, it needs to be a unique password, it needs to be strong, you know, all the good advice around passwords. Mm -hmm. But unless you give people a way to manage that, it's mm -hmm. impossible. Mm -hmm. And we know this, we know that the cognitive load for any human being is way too much if you're, if you're trying to manage hundreds of unique, strong, long, non-dictionary word passwords. So it, it's kind of giving people an impossible task. And sometimes organizations will say, you know, yeah, we, we know we need to do something, but we can't yet roll out a password manager. So then it's like, what are you asking of people? You can't ask them sure. to do the impossible. So what I will always say is if we're raising awareness of a threat, if we're asking people to change a behavior, where are the tools? You know, where is the single sign on or the password manager in that case? Because otherwise you're asking people to do something that they actually physically can't. See, this is exactly why I had you on here, because I love I love the way you think of things. And I mean, now that you've explained that, that makes sense, right? You know, um, just like any leader would do, you can't give an employee a task that they do not have the resources or time or whatever to accomplish. So that's a yeah. great point. And this um, is what I see a lot, you know, that we put this burden on people without understanding what we're really asking of them. Sure. Um, and I guess... A lot of this is, um, you know, creating a culture and creating the time and space to follow these practices. Is there any um, major tooling aspect to this? Um, I know that, you know, when I invited you on, we, we focus a lot on, you know, how can we introduce tools or automation to make our lives easier as people? Uh, do you see any of that in your practice? Yeah, I do. One thing I see is basically what can we do to take that burden off people and tools can be a great way. So if we're thinking about automation, I think there is a really important role there that actually ends up influencing culture. So, for example, if we look at the security team itself, security teams at the moment and for a while have been 
overstretched, under resourced. Mm -hmm. There's a big problem with burnout in the cybersecurity community. So actually, automation can be fantastic. For example, taking the first pass, analyzing malware. Um, it, automation can do a lot to take that kind of first layer of the burden of doing those more routine tasks of a security team, which in turn then can make for a more healthy, productive team. And that then has an impact not just on that team, but on the whole organization, because then you have people who are able to focus on more strategic issues. You have people who are maybe able to actually build more positive relationships yeah. with their colleagues and the rest of the organization because they're not so stressed and, and burnt out. So I think there's a huge role around automation and I, I hope we're gonna see that really pay off in the coming years. Absolutely. And it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem, at least I think with my conversations of the automation will save us time and make us less stressed, but we have to plan and implement the automation. So right. yeah, where do we find the time and energy for that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I know you've touched on earlier a couple of, um, uh, you have the better language to describe this, but a couple of the different ways that people end up manipulating someone to falling for different cyber attacks or scams, right? A sense of urgency is one. Um, the two topics that I per personally thought were really interesting in all of your content um, was the concept of, of 2FA bombing and romance scams, which in my mind um, kind of operate on two maybe different emotions. Yes. Yeah. But I would love for everyone else if you just want to speak to the psychology of that a little bit. Sure. 2FA bombing is, we've seen this in attacks over particularly like the last year or two, where someone is getting so many 2FA requests in that even if, even though they haven't triggered them, we're, they're, they're sort of flooded by it to the point where they're just going to click accept, kind of just to make it stop. But also, I think we are we are primed to click. And this is something we often ignore as well um, uh -huh. in terms of the human side of security is that we're kind of primed to click and to get through stuff. So that's partly what 2FA bombing plays into. And there was one of the attacks recently. I, I, I can't remember which one it was. It may have been the attack um, on MGM. Mm -hmm. But it may not have, but that, that involved social engineering. And it may have been that one where there was some conversation with the attackers that um, that kind of got out where they basically said, use, use 2FA bombing. Because if you flood someone with 2FA requests at one o'clock in the morning and they're getting so many in and it's disturbing their sleep, they're like, oh, OK, I just need to get I just need to get rid of this so I can get back to mm -hmm. sleep. So 2FA bombing, I think as well, it plays into the idea of, oh, if we have 2FA, we'll be fine. Um, and 2FA is great. It adds absolutely a level of um, security beyond simply passwords. But it shows the way that criminals will take whatever control we put in place and try, of course, to find a way mm -hmm. around it, to try and subvert it. And then well, very... also, I guess, too, uh, the fact that you can't just throw a tool at a problem and the yes. problem go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And fatigue. We have known about fatigue in security for many years. Back in 2016, I think it was, NIST did a piece of research talking about this. Um, we know that people feel overwhelmed by security. We ask people to do a lot, this burden that I was talking about around security. And so people are tired already. So then if you're mm -hmm. getting bombarded with 2FA requests, it plays into that fatigue as well. And then on a very different type of scam, romance fraud, um, which again, just horrendous crime and has such a huge impact on victims. It's really distressing. Romance fraud, one thing people underestimate is the long con that criminals will play. So something like 2FA bombing is kind of instantaneous and they're relying mm -hmm. on that knee-jerk reaction. Romance fraud is a long game. Usually you get the amateur criminals who will connect with someone and immediately ask for money, much easier to identify. Uh -huh. But really the organized criminal gangs that are carrying out romance fraud and often coercing people into 
carrying out fraud on their behalf and, and being part of the scam. This is a long game where they will spend weeks, months, even longer building up a connection with somebody. They will use another kind of bombing, love bombing, to force the relationship. They will be sending constant messages with somebody. They will use flattery. They will really try and isolate the victim. They will always have a story. They'll always have a response as to why they can't meet over video, although now they have AI, so that's changing a little bit. And they will spend ages making the relationship seem real before they then either directly ask for money or hint for money or with so-called pig butchering where they say like, oh, I'm making a load of money on crypto and point somebody to a website where they're not even mm -hmm. asking for money. They're just saying you can invest here and the site looks really legitimate. And they use all sorts of tactics within that offering gifts. Hey, when is it your birthday? I want to send you a gift. So then you're sharing your date of birth, you're sharing your address. So they have what they need for identity fraud, but they're also engaging in that reciprocity. Like I've sent you something, I've done this act of good faith. So you're more inclined to, to share something back. Oh, something, yeah. So romance fraud can have this, um, this uh, horrible effect. And I interviewed a woman called Ruth Grover when I was writing my latest book. She's been fighting romance fraud for 10 years or so, supporting victims um, through, through her work, Scam Haters United. And she talked about the triple hit of you have the destruction of a relationship that was never actually real. So psychologically mm. a horrible impact. Then you can lose all of your money. And then you have the identity fraud element as well, where your identity can then be used to take out loans and mortgages and buy things. And so it's a really, really horrible crime. Like a long-term nightmare, it mm -hmm. sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and I think what struck me about that, um, that content that I consumed around romance scams of yours is the fact that you did use the term love bombing, because I mean, if you're on social media, I'm sure that you, you see people talk about, uh, you know, narcissism and love bombing and, and, you know, these, um, I guess, toxic forms of, of love all the yeah. time. And, um, it was just interesting to hear that used in a cybersecurity sense. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I, but I just, no, I never made that yeah. connection. Yeah. It's, it's so true. And they really do that, you know, from the start, we'll build up this, like, kind of like sweep someone off their feet, you know, um, approach to love. And then they'll be using pet names, which again, is part of the love bombing, but also it's tactical. They don't ever have to remember somebody's name because they'll be working on so many victims at a time that if they call all of those victims honey or love or darling or baby, they never have to worry if they're getting, you know, Trudy confused with Barbara or Richard right. confused with Simon. The the classic babe calling you babe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, you know, so many people are finding, um, you know, partners or love online too. So again, I feel like some of these things, um, have different connotations, you know, whatever, 10 years ago than they do today. Today, a lot of people do find that companionship online. And we also had COVID-19, yes. you know, people were connecting online. There's the loneliness epidemic, right? So yeah. I'm sure that so, plays a role. I'm sure you know better. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so true that, of course, connecting online and, and it, you know, it's great that people can have these connections. And I never want to scare people off technology, but just to make people aware that there is, of course, this criminal element out there um, taking advantage of this. And COVID-19, there was a big rise in romance fraud. And really, we've seen it just hit a scale that is huge since then. But of course, unfortunately, because there is also this narrative of if you're a victim of a scam, you're the weakest link. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. Too often we, we talk about victims with this blame. So then people feel a sense of shame and they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to report it. And so it stays hidden. So then people don't know about it as much and, and more people become victims. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely see it. And uh, I really appreciate that you have been shedding light on these um, very under-discussed topics. 
Thank um, you. <laughs> I'm gonna, I wanna make sure that we get, uh, I'm especially excited to talk about your book, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit. Um, I One other emerging, I guess, um, tool being used in cyber attacks, right, is AI, right? Everybody is talking about AI now. Yeah. Um, the, the two things that I personally have found the scariest are the concept of deep fakes, right? So people can, you know, take an image of you and turn it into a video or, you know, whatever, um, or can clone, you know, snippets of your voice and, and train an, an AI model on that, right? Um, so what kind of trends do you see in terms of these cyber attacks? And is there anything we can do to protect ourselves or are we just helpless? Yeah, it's um, it, it really, for me, ties into that that critical thinking and having digital critical thinking skills, I think is crucial. Deep fakes are, are a scary thing. And unfortunately we are seeing more and more cases. It's still not mainstream. We still see much more of your, the kind of phishing that we've all gotten more used to, even if it has become more sophisticated, but there are increasing reports of deep fake technology being used, both audio and video. And we're just actually working on a demo uh, in my company, Sygenta, to show a deep fake that's been really easy to create a bit too. Yeah, to okay. So that's that's coming soon. You'll see it. Um, yeah, yeah, excited. When we see attacks that are involving deep fakes, there's, there's some trends we've seen. One really common one is, um, sorry, I don't really want to say it's really common, but one increasing attack around the use of audio deepfake is CEO fraud that we kind of see over email. An email comes in, it looks like it comes from somebody on the executive team, you need to transfer a sum of money. Now we're seeing increasing reports of phone calls using the voice of somebody on the executive mm -hmm. team. And so that's just so much more convincing when you hear a voice. There's also reports um, of fake kidnapping. So parent, grandparent receiving a call saying your child has been kidnapped. Sometimes your child is in hospital, is in prison, and then the child's voice is on the phone. Oh, and yeah. that's, I can't imagine what that must be like. And victims of that have spoken about having that kind of sense of PTSD afterwards, of hearing your child's voice so distressed. And even when you're told it's a deep fake, it's a mimic, it's an AI imitation, you've still heard that. Horrible. Yeah. So it's helping people be aware of these. And there, there was a video CEO fraud case. It was a Hong Kong company. Very recently, an individual was on a Teams call. They thought with their colleagues, it turned out that they were on a Teams call with deep fakes. And oh they transferred gosh. $25 million no. off the back of this. A series of transactions that they thought they were being told to do over a video call. So that's insane. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I understand. I mean, I, if I was in that position again, I would probably have done the same thing, but that's absolutely insane. It's just, um, and a lot of people, of course, don't realize how much deep fakes have advanced in recent years. It's so new deep fakes, you know, coined in 2017. That's where we saw the technology first being used. It took a lot of computing power and a lot of data it took a lot mm -hmm. of images to build deep fakes. And even then, um, there were a lot more telltale signs. Now, deep fakes are just a lot easier to create with much less data. And again, you still can see some signs of kind of synthetic media where there might be some like weird blurring around the neck. Um, there, you know, a hand, it's very hard to have a deep fake where like a hand goes over the face uh -huh. and it doesn't mess it up. So there's things like that. The voice, you can sometimes just hear that it's off, but the uncanny valley is getting smaller. And I think so that's what me, scares people too is, yeah. you know, how much time do we have before you can't tell the difference? It's scary. It really is scary. And what I really tell people, though, is is not to be too afraid. Like, yes, this is a threat that's out there. And yes, it is. Of course, it's scary. But at the same time, if we lead with fear, then that just paralyzes us. 
So instead, we need to understand it. We need to stay you know, up to date with the threat and what's happening. But we also really need to tune into those critical digital thinking skills mm. and pay attention to how something makes us feel because that's what scammers often use. They push us into this way of thinking where we're processing information quickly, where we're not thinking before we act. You know, So if we look at behavioral economics, they talk about system one, system two, thinking fast, thinking slow. Mm -hmm. And social engineers push us into thinking fast, where we are more impulsive, we are easier to manipulate, we're more likely to act because of that authority or influence or flattery. So if we pay attention to how we feel, then we can take a step back and think, hold on, should I verify this another way? Should I check that this is legitimate? And in that way, the scams are the same as they have always been. They're just using technology to be more convincing. I love that. I love that. And so, yeah, so I guess being mindful, being, again, um, not being quick or um, not being coerced, I guess, into a sense of urgency, yeah. having the power, feeling like you have the power maybe to yeah. think through actions and, and feelings. Um, yeah, no, that's incredible. Um, no, okay, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry, um, it's no surprise that people who receive more email are more likely to interact with a phishing email. So if somebody gets more email, research shows that they are more likely to click a link or download a, a malicious attachment because they're overwhelmed. So actually being able to slow down, be more mindful, take our time a little bit more would yeah. really help us from a cybersecurity perspective. I saw that. I, th I probably saw it from you. I, I did just read that too. And, you know, I almost... Even even though this message of you know mindfulness and and people is very simple, it almost feels like therapy in some way. In in which you have to take every single particular situation in which you're used to, you know, blaming people or you know yeah. expecting a tool to do it, and be like, well, actually, you know, there are yeah. very logical reasons someone might act this way or feel this way. Um, yeah. Just very interesting. I love that you said that because it's the most common thing that people say to us at the end of our focus groups. <laughs> And they're always surprised. They're like, that felt like therapy. <laughs> because cybersecurity is so often a bit harsh. Oh, and, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think bringing empathy to it is really crucial. I, I think even the introduction of or discussion of feelings is kind of like, ew, yeah. why? <laughs> <laughs> yep, I hear you. Um, but I have, we have just a few minutes left. So I definitely want to talk about your upcoming book. Um, so just, just so that people, um, you know, can, can, uh, feel like I know that you write high quality material. Um, I did buy, <laughs> I actually, I didn't buy the latest version of your book on accident. I bought the first one, the bestseller, uh, confident cybersecurity. Um, but similar to the rest of your comment or content was just really impressed with um, how you take a really relatable and simple approach to everything. You know, you take this kind of like we've been alluding to this entire time, this really complex, often intimidating, fear-induced field. And you're just like, actually, you know, boop, it's really simple <laughs> and, it's, and it's relatable and it's, and it's kind of fun. It's, it's a puzzle. I think right. you use that term in your book. Um, so your new book, Hacked, is coming out in the U.S., um, at the end of this month, I believe, right? It is, yeah. It's already out in the UK? Yeah, it's out in the UK and most other places apart from the US and Canada where oh, books always come out later. I don't understand yeah. why this happens, <laughs> but good things come to those who wait. So it's coming. <laughs> but yeah, it's coming out on the 30th of April and I'm really pleased with the reception it's had so far. So I'm excited for it to get to the US and Canada. Uh, what what inspired you to to write this book? I would love just to have hear the epiphany moment or the moment of inspiration. For me, it's I wrote Confident Cybersecurity essentially for the version of me that was starting out in this field, where I wanted something to help me understand this big picture and what my role in it could be and to try and make it all more digestible. So that was my aim with Confident Cybersecurity particularly aimed at people who have a more professional interest in cybersecurity, either because they work adjacent to it or they're entering the field or they're new in, in the role. Then for Hacked, I wrote certainly for those people, but also for 
the people who I so often work with when I'm doing awareness raising, where I'm talking about the threats and I'm helping them understand how the threats relate to them and also what they can do to protect themselves. That was really my aim with Hacked. Each chapter focuses on a different threat, breaking it down and really bringing it to life. So I lead with storytelling. There are lots of stories and case studies in there. And I also interviewed lots of people from across the cybersecurity field, including victims, advocates, including investigators, including you know people who work in security leadership roles and ex-fraudsters to understand actually these things that we hear about in the headlines take take some of the layers away, peel that back and help people understand the reality that we are facing in terms of cybersecurity. But for every chapter, it was important for me to include what people can do to protect themselves. And a lot of those behaviors are fundamental. A lot of them span across the different threats. So I really wanted to empower people, both with the knowledge of the threats, but also with the information to be able to go away and rather than feeling intimidated, feel that they could actually engage with this and, and be safer and enjoy technology feeling. Empower. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I know that some of the stories that you discuss in here are, you know, um, huge cyber incidents, notorious cyber incidents. And, you know, you talk about all of the interviews and things you had to do for this. But, um, you know, in my experience, a lot of times cybersecurity attacks can often be um, more hush hush or, you know, people don't want to talk a lot about what led to something truly. What kind of preparation and research went into this? And, you know, was there some sort of you know, trust building, I guess, that had to go on to for you to be able to talk to people about these things. Yeah, it's it's so challenging in security. And of course, there's lots of incidents that people <laughs> don't talk about, don't want to talk about. So it's, you know, you have to be aware of that, I think, in the field and communicating about it. Luckily, because I've worked in the industry for a while now, built up a great network, I was able to talk to people who know me, trust me, um, who knew that I would handle what they were telling me um, sensitively. And then it was just a great opportunity for me to really dig into a lot of this stuff and to have such interesting conversations that I'm then able to share with the readers, which is which is really great. Uh -huh. So I'm glad that I could do that and bring it to life and use interviews and storytelling because I think that's such a way to help people understand the field when you can actually tell a story of this is what happened this is how it worked this is what they were trying to do this is the impact that can really then help people wrap their heads around it sure yeah well i'm glad that your reputation preceded you and that <laughs> that that helped a little a little bit with the uh trust building but absolutely and i i find that too um again in the cybersecurity space right like the it's the storytelling where there's power i mean all communication i think that is effective has some element of storytelling, but by having that shame mm -hmm. and, and um, I, I don't know, I guess shame even maybe from a company yeah. side, right? Mm -hmm. Not even just, you know, an individual who is targeted by a phishing attack by having that shame, we really don't have the um, benefit and camaraderie and learning experience of, of hearing each other's stories. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we approach something with empathy and with wanting to understand, then it takes that shame away. And shame, we, again, the research shows just how destructive it is. For example, when there's a, an incident, if the person who has, say, clicked the link in a company is led to an incident, if that person is dealt with in a negative way and shame is placed on that person, research shows that actually they're likely to leave that company that's how impactful mm, it is. Okay. So shame is very destructive. And when we can take that away and apply empathy, that's when we can really learn. I love it. I am very excited for this book to come out. So can people, can the Americans, uh, can we pre-order it? Or what, what are the details? You can, you can pre-order Hacked anywhere you buy books. 
Okay, awesome. And where can people follow you for your fun tidbits of information on social media platforms? So you can find me on most social media platforms, increasingly on TikTok, as we <laughs> discussed. But you can find me on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on TikTok, on YouTube, at Dr. Jessica Barker. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you, Jessica. I knew it would be, but I'm glad that I could confirm that. I had a great time Same. with you. And um excited for the book to come out so um uh i'll end it there um and um well i'll talk thank to you, you so much